Now I know that Revelation is a book that can scare off an awful lot of people. And that's because most people open up the book of Revelation and they try to read it. Maybe you've opened it before for your morning devotions, or maybe you've gone through it in a small group setting. And you, you try to read it on your own without help and in isolation from anything else in the Bible. And with most books of the Bible, you open up to them and you read them and you can pretty much figure out what's going on. But in Revelation, if you open it up and read it just by itself in isolation, not really knowing anything else about what the scriptures have said about the study of the end times, you're going to end up being very confused. Most people get through chapters one and two and three, maybe even four and five, and they're tracking pretty closely with it. But then you get to chapter six, much less seven and eight, and it becomes just incredibly confusing. And the reason why that is, is because it'd be kind of like opening up, you know, a book like War and Peace, for instance, turning in it to the very last chapter and thinking that you should be able to understand all of the plot lines and character development and everything that's been going on over the last, let's say, thousand pages. Well, if all you know is what you're reading in the very last chapter of the book, that last chapter isn't going to make much sense at all. And the same thing is true with the book of Revelation. Revelation is literally God's last word before he closed the canon and stopped issuing new revelation. And it's not just his last word, it's also his preview of the last things. And that really is the meaning of the term eschatology. It's the study of last things. It's God's last word about these last things. But there's no way for you to make either heads or tails of this if you don't understand the big picture of God's redemptive story from the beginning of the book all the way to the end. You can't just pick up this last chapter and expect to understand it in isolation from the rest of what has already been revealed over the course of the other 60-some books of the Bible. But if you understand that big picture, then the last chapter of Revelation is going to make all kinds of sense. And in fact, it will become incredibly powerful and clear for you in your life today. But if you take it in isolation, it's honestly going to seem kind of bizarre. Let's just be honest. The result of that situation is that many people, and honestly, some churches and some pastors, have resolved to simply ignore it. But friend, you and I, we're not allowed to do that with any part of God's word. We might shake our heads and wonder at a man like Thomas Jefferson who cuts parts of his Bible that have to do with the miraculous and removes them. And we might condemn him for that and say, you can't do that to the word of God. And yet many people proceed to practically do exactly the same thing to the book of Revelation because they just simply don't understand it. Some people, because of the complexity of this book, have simply resolved to say, well, I'm not going to worry about it. God's going to do what God's going to do, and I don't need to know. But if you didn't need to know, God would not have put this book within his scripture. Because it's in his scripture and it's been divinely revealed by God, that means you do need to know. He didn't give us this book to confuse us or to obscure the future. No, he gave us this great book to encourage us to explain and clarify the future so that we might have hope and be blessed in the reception of understanding what God is doing and where he is directing in his sovereignty the totality of humanity and human history. That's the reason why in Revelation 1-3 we're told right up front that whoever reads and heeds this book is going to be blessed. A promise that is not only stated at the beginning, but is reaffirmed in the final chapter at the very end of the book. That whoever reads this book, hears it, and does what is contained within it is blessed. See, this is not a book that was given to be a user manual for people who are left behind in the tribulation period. No, this book was given to encourage your heart and mine today 
in our walk with Christ and to have hope. To say that you don't need eschatology or that you're allergic to eschatology is honestly a really big mistake. And the reason for that is because according to some estimates, 25% of your Bible is eschatology. So you can't just purpose in your heart to ignore it or to move around it or to say, I'll figure it out someday when I get to heaven. No, a quarter of your Bible is eschatology. So if you want to know and understand the full counsel of God and the story of his word, this is a critical area of investigation and understanding that we must undertake together. So look, we're not free to simply ignore this or to make it mean whatever we want it to mean. We really do need to get some clarity together, and that is the purpose of this session. What we're going to be doing here together is spending really this next hour going through a a flyover, a big picture understanding of God's plan as it relates to the last things. So part one, this session, is going to give us a flyover of that big picture. Part two, a second session, is going to get down into the weeds of Revelation specifically and what, what is going on in Revelation. So you can't really get down into what's going on in Revelation until you understand the big picture. And that's where we're going to start here in this session with the big picture. Session two is going to focus on the specifics of what's happening in Revelation itself. So let's begin. I want to start with some key definitions. And look, I, I don't expect you to remember all of these right now up front. And it's possible that until you've watched this whole session, the definitions I'm about to give you aren't going to make any sense at all. But I I know that some of you might want to know up front exactly where I'm coming from. And some of you may watch this video, I know, more than once. In fact, I, I hope that you will. And the more that you hear these terms, I promise you, the clearer they're going to become. So here goes. I know these are big words that we've got to define up front. But stick with me through them, and I promise to explain things as we go. So here's where I'm coming from. I'm a kind of dispensationalist. I know that's a big theological term. But it means that I subscribe to a system of theology that flows from a normal, literal interpretation of Scripture. This system draws a distinction between Israel and the church, And it sees a future plan of God for ethnic Israel. Now, this system, dispensationalism, meaning that God works with these various groups of people during different dispensations of human history, stands in contrast to what is known as covenant theology. Now, this gets a little bit confusing here for a couple of reasons. Let me just explain them up front. And the first reason this gets confusing is that there are different kinds or brands of covenant theologians, just as there are different kinds and brands of different dispensationalists. There are different streams of thought within each of these broad camps. But most broadly speaking, you've got covenantalism and dispensationalism. But there's a spectrum within those camps of belief. Now, the other reason why this is confusing, stick with me, is because dispensationalists, which is what I am, what this church teaches, we still believe in the covenants that are contained in the Old Testament and throughout Scripture. It's just that we don't see the church as being a replacement for Israel, with God having a single covenanted people. So to say that I'm a dispensationalist, that does not mean that I reject or don't affirm the biblical covenants. I do affirm the biblical covenants, but unlike covenantal theology, I see and draw a distinction between ethnic Israel on the one hand and the New Testament church on the other. Clear as mud? I thought so. That'll make more sense as we go, I promise. That's the first thing you need to know. I'm a Committed kind of dispensationalist. Second thing that I would define for you is that I am also a committed premillennialist. This means that I believe that Jesus will return before the beginning of the millennial kingdom. 
wherein he is going to reign over a literal, physical kingdom. This position, premillennialism, stands in contrast most broadly to positions such as amillennialism and postmillennialism. Amillennialists do not believe in a literal kingdom, and they interpret the statements about the millennial reign of Christ to be true now in a spiritual sense only. Premillennialists believe that there will be a literal kingdom and that Christ will return in the second coming, which then inaugurates a literal kingdom on earth, and that's all going to be future. Postmillennialists believe that Jesus will return after the millennial kingdom, which is partly spiritual and partly physical. Now, I don't believe that either of those viewpoints are tenable, and we'll explain that as we go. Rather, we believe that Christ will return in person, after which he will reign on earth for a thousand literal years. So most broadly speaking, dispensationalist and premillennialist. But there's a third big term that I need to throw out and define here at the beginning, and that is to say that I am also a pre-tribulationalist. That means that I believe that the rapture of the church, that's us now, our removal from this world, our being snatched away, I believe in a physical rapture where Christ will come and gather his church to himself, that that ingathering, that rapturing will take place before the tribulation period. Some people believe, who believe in a rapture, that the rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation. Some people believe that the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation. And some who reject the literal millennial kingdom reject the concept of a rapture altogether. But we believe here, and I believe, that the plain teaching of Scripture is that the rapture of the church will take place prior to the tribulation. Okay, so dispensationalism... There there is a distinction between Israel and the church, a clear distinction. And God has his plans for each of these groups. Premillennialism, Jesus will return to earth in person and will reign for a thousand years then once he has returned in a literal physical kingdom. Pre-tribulationalism teaches that the church, that's us, we will be removed before the tribulation period. Now I know, I just put a lot out there for you to understand. And those terms are big ones, those ideas are big ones, and you're floating around not having seen the big picture yet. And so you're trying to understand what are you talking about right now. I warned you up front that those definitions might not make a lot of sense until you've listened to the, the, le- the, the rest of this lesson. But having received the totality of this lesson, I promise you that those terms will make great sense once you've seen the big picture. But it's important to let you know up front where we are coming from as a church in what we believe. So all that I just said, I promise you, will make more sense as we go through here, but we had to establish those terms up front. So let's now begin. All right, to understand the future that is described in Revelation, to really get what's going on in Revelation, as I said a few minutes ago, you can't start in Revelation. You've got to rewind the tape and look back at the totality of everything in Scripture. You've got to go way back, 2,600 years back. Now, we could go back even further to see the full scope of God's plan, But for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to start in 605 BC. The year is 605 BC, and Judah has been given over into the hands of the Babylonian Empire under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And for the first time in 600 years, the people have been removed from their land. They've been taken into exile, and over the next 20 years, the Babylonians keep coming back and keep taking more and more and more of them into exile. All the promises of God throughout the Old Testament had been aimed at the people not only being in their land, but the land of Israel and the people of Israel being central to the plan of God. 
So for thousands of years, God has been making promises to national Israel, and all those promises were contingent upon the people of God being there in the land. And now 605 rolls around, and because of the people's rebellion and rejection of God and his ways, the Babylonians have been given the authority by God to come in and take Israel captive, destroy their city, and haul everybody who is anybody off into captivity. It seems to the Israelites in that day, to the people of Judah specifically, that God's plan is moving in reverse. It doesn't seem like things are going well. The Babylonians defeat Israel in 605. They destroy the temple ultimately in 586 BC. And it it looks like God's plan is not only in reverse, but it's been completely undone. And so from their perspective, they're saying, we're going in the wrong direction here. And it's this event where Israel is, Judah, is removed from the land specifically and the temple of God is destroyed that begins a period of time, which you can see here, that is known as the time of the Gentiles. A time that is going to stretch from the destruction of Jerusalem in 605 when the Gentiles come in and take control of the land. A time that is going to continue on all the way until the second coming. We are in that time of the Gentiles right now, a time that will extend all the way until we get to the second coming of Jesus. Now, having said all of this, there is a young man who has been taken into captivity in Babylon. And as he sits in exile, his heart breaks for his people. His name is Daniel. And as He sits there in exile, hundreds of miles from his home. His heart is breaking for his people. See, he is reading the Old Testament. And as he's reading his Old Testament Bible, he is finding thousands of prophecies about what God is going to do with Israel in the future. Promises and prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. And he knows that this, the situation I'm in right now, stuck in Babylon, this is not the way that things should be. Now, the Messiah has been promised in all of these different Old Testament prophecies and and prophets, and, and there are many more besides just these. There were promises that were made to Abraham that have not yet been fulfilled. There were promises of a coming Messiah that were made to David that have not yet been fulfilled. And Isaiah has talked about a future day when the Messiah is going to rule and reign. And Jeremiah has talked about a new covenant that he will make where he will come and establish his presence in the, in the hearts of his, his people. None of that has happened. But here I am, not in, not in Jerusalem, not in Judah, and, and it looks for all the world like the plan of God has been undone. How is God going to reconcile everything that He has promised with the situation that we're in? We want the coming of the Messiah, but we're stuck in Babylon. How is this going to be fixed? But, As Daniel continues to unfold, Daniel is informed in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7 that things are going to get better, much, uh, things are going to get worse, much worse before they get better. See, God has given Daniel two different visions. They have the same meaning. It's the same vision, just using different images each time. And the interpretation of both visions that is given to Daniel is that the Babylonians would not be the last empire, the last Gentile nation who would rule and reign over the people of God. No, there were going to be three other empires that would come after the Babylonian period. The Persians would come, the Greeks would come, the Romans would come. And so as Daniel's hearing all of these visions, first in chapter 2, then in chapter 7, He's coming to the realization that this is no short-term issue. We are here in exile, and as far as God's plan is concerned, He has hundreds of years worth of exile for us. And His heart absolutely breaks. Now, it's amazing, just as a side note, to see the way that each of these prophecies... Babylon is called in Daniel 2, the head of gold. In Daniel 7, they're referred to as a lion with wings. The specific historical fulfillment can be traced in history. It is amazing to see the specificity with which each of these prophecies in Daniel 2 and 7 were all fulfilled historically in the years that came between Daniel's day 
and the day of Jesus. And if you want to know more about how those prophecies were specifically fulfilled, there's audio sessions of teaching that I have done in the book of Daniel, both two and seven, that you can trace those, and I'd be happy to give you that content and access to it if you're interested in seeing how God specifically, historically fulfilled the visions of Daniel 2 and of Daniel 7. But as we get into Daniel 9, Daniel's heart is breaking. The text says that he's greatly troubled because, again, these visions have indicated that the promises of God are not going to be fulfilled anytime soon. So in Daniel 9, what we find is this great prophet of God pouring his heart out to God. And to summarize Daniel 9, because we've got to go quickly here, this is Daniel's prayer. Look, we sinned badly. And Lord, I know that your plan is utterly perfect. But at the same time, you made all these promises. And in light of where we are, because of our own sin, that's on us, not you. How are your promises, which are on you, going to be fulfilled? When is all of this going to happen? Which brings us now to what is revealed in Daniel chapter 9, where God gives Daniel the key to understanding his prophetic plans. Now, the importance of Daniel 9, now that we've kind of worked our way through the context into Daniel 9, the key in Daniel 9, the, the centrality of this text cannot be overstated to understanding the field of eschatology. If you do not understand Daniel 9, revelation, sudden, it, revelation is completely incomprehensible. But if you do understand Daniel 9, Revelation suddenly becomes very clear. You do understand it, Revelation will make sense. You don't understand it, Revelation's going to be very, very confusing. Here's what's going on in Daniel chapter 9. Let's explain this briefly. God in this text, you can see it right there, prophesies that there are going to be a total of 70 weeks in his prophetic plan during this time of the Gentiles before the Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom, which has been prophesied in multiple ways throughout the Old Testament, 70 weeks. Now, the way that that's translated in our Bible is a little bit confusing because when we think of a week, we think of, well, obviously seven days, Sunday to Saturday. But that's not what the text is talking about. The text literally says 70 sevens. It's better to understand this as a week of years. It's a, it's a period of time that is seven in length, but it's not a period of seven days. It's a period of seven years. Seventy sets of seven years. That's the way to think about it. 490 years is how long it's going to take for all of this to unfold. And you say, well, are you just simply making that up? Where are you getting that from? Well, I know because there are some very specific details that are given to us here. In verse 25, you'll see that we're told that we need to understand that it's from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, that's the Messiah. So from the time when the word goes out to rebuild the destroyed Jerusalem, that's when the clock starts, to the time when the Messiah will come, that is going to be 69 sets of seven. He says there that it's going to be 62 sets of seven and seven sets of seven. You add 62 and seven together, you get 69. 69 times seven is 483. So it's going to be 483 years from the date that the decree goes out from a ruler to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah will come. That's clearly what he says there. And after those 62, which earlier he explained, there's also a seven more added in there. We'll simplify this here. So after 69 weeks, an anointed one, that's the Messiah, will be cut off and shall have nothing. Now they don't understand what that means, but looking back in retrospect, we certainly do. So let's keep going. That's what we really want to know, right? When is the Messiah coming? And you can see that here, that God tells Daniel it's going to be 69 sets of seven. That's 483 years. So you say, okay, well, when did that clock start ticking on these 483 years? Well, as we just learned, it's when the decree goes out to rebuild Jerusalem. And wouldn't you know it, that that date of the decree going out to rebuild Jerusalem 
is one of the best attested dates in ancient history. The Encyclopedia Britannica even records it for us. There are multiple other data points throughout the uh, world history that tie in their, their timing back to this date because it's a date that is well known, well recorded, well attested. Everybody recognizes this date as being one where this, this event definitely happened and it happened on this particular date. Wouldn't you know it? On March 14th, 445 B.C., King Artaxerxes gives the decree and Nehemiah sets off to do the work. And it's on that day where the prophetic clock, 483 years, clicks into motion. 445 BC, Nehemiah begins to rebuild Jerusalem. You can see that there in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, the account of how that decree was issued to Nehemiah in direct fulfillment of what God had done told Daniel was going to happen. But the reason why that date is so important is because it sets in motion this clock on these years, these sets of years that God has prophesied to Daniel that it's going to take for his plan to unfold before the Messiah will arrive. And wouldn't you know it, exactly 483 years later, using their, the calculation of their calendar and how they counted time, to the very day, is the day that Jesus comes riding on a donkey at the triumphal entry in 32 AD. There have been extensive studies done and they can demonstrate how that to the day, Jesus shows up 483 years after the decree goes out to rebuild Jerusalem. Precisely what God said to Daniel in this prophecy of the 69 weeks. Amazing. And if you're paying close attention, back when we read Daniel 9, you'll remember that it was said that after these first 69 weeks, something strange and inexplicable was going to happen that those people in that day just simply could not understand. You'll remember that it was said after these first 69 weeks that the Messiah was going to be cut off, which is exactly what happens then in 32 AD at the cross. Wait, what? See, it's here that the plan of God takes a turn that no one throughout the Old Testament saw coming. The Jews proceed to reject their Messiah. That's what happens at the cross. His arrival had been clearly explained and prophesied down to the very day. Jesus comes offering a spiritual deliverance rather than the physical one that they're all looking for. And so they kill their king. Does that mean that the plan of God has now been derailed somehow? No. It means rather that the plan of God now shifts for a very specific reason away from the people of Israel, which is represented by this blue line, and to a new body of people, to the church. That is what is happening now. And that's really where we are here in God's plan. You can see that here. We are part of this church. Now, this is where I want to get into the distinction just a little bit between Israel, that which took place, the focus of God's plans prior to the cross, and the Gentile people, which is now what we're experiencing here in the, the current day church. I want to explain that just a little bit, a little bit more. Because there's many passages that attest to this, and we can't go to all of them here in this context, but I'll just give you a couple so that you can understand it. Very clearly in Romans 11, we're told about a temporary shift that takes place in God's program and planning from the people of Israel to now the people of the church. Paul says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. That word's going to be important in a second. This mystery, brothers, he says, look, a partial hardening has happened upon Israel. It's not permanent. It will be undone. But they have hardened their hearts, and during this period of time, their hearts are hard towards God. And it's going to remain that way until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. You can see that explanation there. 
that until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Well, what is the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, Paul explains that and this concept of a mystery, the fullness of the Gentiles, a little bit more over in Ephesians chapter 3. This mystery, this thing that was unknown before, this newly revealed thing, he's not saying that it's a mysterious thing or that it's an unknowable thing. That's not what he means by mystery. It's simply saying this thing that now we see that wasn't seen before, they didn't know it was coming, This new thing is what we now understand. What is this mystery? Well, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Wait, what? Members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. It's of this gospel that I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, listen now, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What does that mean? Well, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of this mystery hidden for ages in God, that he was going to turn his attention now, not just to Israel, but to everybody, the one who created all things. And how is he going to do that? So that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. See, this is God's plan. It's to bring a universal blessing, not just to the people of Israel. That's been the story of the Old Testament. But now to the nations, that's what he promised to do to Abraham, that through you and through your descendants, namely Jesus Christ, there will be a universal blessing that comes to all men. And the church is the manifestation of that universal blessing. It's the reason why Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 16, look, I've got other sheep that are not of this fold. Who's he talking about there? He's talking to the Jews and to his disciples, but he says, I've got to bring those sheep in also, these these ones that are from another flock. And in the end... When all is said and done, there will be one flock with one shepherd in the end. But for now, there's this Jewish flock, but there's also another flock that Jesus is concerned about bringing in. In Acts chapter 15, verses 14 through 15, Peter talks about how God brought the word of the gospel to the Gentiles. But then he goes on and says, look, after I brought the word of the gospel to the Gentiles and and have established the church, I'm going to return And I'm going to rebuild the fallen tent of David. Clearly indicating that God is not done with the people, the ethnic people of Israel. His plan for them has not yet been completed. There is more that needs to happen for the promises of God to ethnic Israel to be fully fulfilled. God's made many promises that apply specifically to national Israel. Promises that were never fulfilled. Up until this point in history, things that have just never happened. You can't take those promises, spiritualize them, and now grant them to the church and say, because God, because Israel rejected their Messiah, now everything that had been promised to them goes exclusively to the Gentiles. Well, that is to make God unfaithful. He unilaterally said, by the power of his own word and his own truthfulness and integrity, I will do this. Regardless of what you do, I will do this in you, through you, for you. And to date, there are things that he has not yet done for them. So you can't just transfer those literal promises and their benefits onto the church and say they're no longer for Israel. No, they clearly have to be for Israel. God promised them. He covenanted with Israel, his national ethnic people, to do these things. And so at some point, as Peter says here in Acts 14, God is going to come back and rebuild the house of David and fulfill every single last one of those promises. So that's where we are right now. We are here during this church age. We don't know how long that church age is going to be, how long it's going to last. I really wish I could set a date for you on that, but I can't because God hasn't. He says no one knows the date or the hour of that except for himself. But that's where we are right now. As the church, the Gentile nations, and there are Jews that are included within that who come to faith in Christ during this period of time, but it's this church now that is primarily comprised of the Gentile nations. Remember, we're still here in the time of the Gentiles that are now being grafted into the plan, the redemptive plan of God. And so it is to that church specifically that Jesus is speaking primarily in Revelation 1 through 3. It's why in Revelation 1.19, he says to John, I've got some things to say to you today. Record those things that are. But then, John, in Revelation, 
I've got some things that I've got to say about those things that are about to take place. Some things that he literally says will happen after this. Well, what is it that's going to happen after this? After the things that are currently happening? Revelation 1 through 3. These are the instructions for the churches during this period of the church age. But what's going to happen after the church age? And, and that then begs the question, well, how does the church age come to its conclusion? And that really gets us down to the question of what the next event is on the prophetic calendar in God's plan. It comes to an end with the rapture of the church. Where Christ comes, you can see that there, and he raptures his church. He raptures his church to be with him in heaven. And so will we ever be with the Lord in the air. That's explained to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, where it very clearly talks about believers in this present time who are alive in the day of the rapture. Again, we don't know when that's going to take place. There's no way to know when it's going to take place. We as believers are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We are snatched away. The word that's used there in the text is the Greek word harpazo. It means to snatch. It has the idea of a, of a harpoon that one would throw to, to snatch and pull something out of a particular place. It's where we get our word harpoon. That's the idea of the word uh, harpazo, which we translate as rapture. We're taken away to meet the Lord in the air. But the reason why Paul was talking about the rapture here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 is because there were early Christians who knew of this rapture and were imminently looking forward to the rapture. In fact, we're told that early Christians were known as people who had their eyes constantly pointed to heaven because they were looking for the return of Jesus at any time. We believe that this rapture is imminent. That means it could happen at any time. There are no prophetic events that have to take place before the rapture could, could happen. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be in a hundred years. We don't know when this will take place. But what we have been commanded to be is to be ready, to be looking, to be waiting eagerly for the, the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there were some people there in the church of Thessalonica who were concerned that, hey, Jesus hasn't come back yet. Some years have gone by since his departure and we've got loved ones dying. So what's going to happen to them in the day of rapture? Well, Paul goes on to explain, look, those who have passed away, those who have fallen asleep already there in verse 15, they too will be caught up and we all, the living and the dead, will meet the Lord in the air. Which he goes on to explain a little bit more in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 57, where he talks about the fact that all the believers in the church who have died before this rapturing, this coming of Christ to gather his church and to remove them, they will be resurrected and taken to heaven at this point as well. Verse 52 says, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and then we all, living and dead, we all will be changed. And that is the point at which the church receives its resurrection Living dead saints from this church age are all gathered together up into heaven, and so shall we always be with the Lord, having met him in the air. Which then begs the question, well, what happens then? What happens to all of us? I mean, that's what we're most concerned with. What's, what's the plan for me, specifically, as it relates to what happens after the rapture? Well, Scripture is clear that believers are then presented before God at what is known as the Bema Seat Judgment. Now, this is not a judgment where we need to fear condemnation. It's not as though God is determining whether or not he'll keep us in heaven, having been raptured there to that place. No, this is a judgment where we are rewarded for our faithfulness during our time on earth. It's what's known as the Bema Seat Judgment. Bema being the Greek word for judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10 talks about this and what it will be like for us. Paul says there, look, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And whatever we're doing in this life, we seek to please Christ. Why? <laughs> because we know that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each of us may receive what is due for what we've done in the body, this body, during this life, whether good or evil. 
Now it's important to clarify here that this is not a determination of, of life or death. This is not describing salvation by works that God's going to look at you and judge your fitness to be there with him based upon what you did during this life. No, you're, you're there. You were raptured in the first place because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you got to that place. That's how you were saved. That's how you were brought before the throne of God. But once you arrive there, you, you will be judged on your faithfulness to Christ during this life. This is not salvation by works, but it is the point at which you are rewarded for what you have done during this life. 1 Corinthians 3.11, all the way down through 4.5, talks a little bit more about what that's going to be like when it talks about being willing to build during this life intentionally with what you do. It says, look, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's your basis for being there. But once you come to him, you're going to be building a body of work that someday you're going to present before him at his judgment seat. And some people may build there, verse 12, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. And everyone's work in that day will be made manifest for that day, the day of the rapture, the day of the Bema Seat judgment is what I believe, will disclose it. Because in that day, it's going to be revealed by fire the fire of being in the presence of God. And the fire will test what sort of work each one have done. If the work that anyone has built on that foundation of Christ survives, well, he's going to receive a reward. If you did it for Christ as unto him, and you did that which was good, that is in, in, in accordance with his expectations, a reward will come to you in that day. But if your work is built, bur burned up because you did evil, or you did, it, you did good, but you did it for yourself, well, you're going to suffer loss. Notice he doesn't say there you'll be condemned and sent to hell. No, he says you'll be saved, but as through fire. You'll be standing there smelling of smoke with nothing to offer God, which is a pretty significant motivation for us, for how we ought to be living today, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, seeking to serve the Lord. And he says, look, uh, God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So act accordingly which the people in Corinth weren't. And that's why Paul gives them this admonition here. That's really the future of what awaits the church. We are in the church age. We will be raptured and the dead in Christ. They will be resurrected. And all of us together, living and dead saints of the church, will appear before the Lord at the beam of saint judgment in his presence. Now that might be the point at which you say, okay, we're done. But the problem is that finishes at Revelation 3. We haven't even gotten into Revelation 4 through 22 yet. Because here's the thing. If you've been tracking along with me, which I hope you have been, you will realize and remember that there was a 70th week in Daniel's prophecy that we have not yet even talked about. You remember that God told Daniel about 70 sets of seven years. Christ came after 69 sets of seven. He dies, which then kicks off the church, which was revealed at that point. But whatever happened to that 70th set of seven years? The one where God told Daniel in Daniel 9, 26 through 27, and the people of the prince who is to come, that's the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, that's Jerusalem. And its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he, the Antichrist, shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of that week, so for three and a half years, remember when we say week here, we're talking about a set of seven years, for half of that set of seven years, he shall put an end to sacrifice and the offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate the abomination of desolation until the decree end is poured out on the desolator, the Antichrist himself. Well, that hasn't happened yet. 69 sets of seven goes by, Christ comes, they reject him as the Messiah, the church is inserted, but once the church is removed, we've still got the 70th week of years to deal with. And these verses begin to talk about what that 70th week is going to look like. See, once the church is removed from the earth, the, re the attention now returns to the nation of Israel as God turns his attention back away from the time of the Gentiles, now to bring his chosen covenanted ethnic people of Israel to salvation, number one, and in that 70th week, to bring judgment upon the earth. This is what happens during this 70th week 
that is prophesied in Daniel, and you may know it more commonly as being the tribulation period, which is how it is referred to during the book of Revelation, which, by the way, the tribulation period in the book of Revelation is said to be exactly, go figure, seven years long. The 70th week of Daniel is still in the future. Revelation refers to that seven-year period as being the tribulation period. So that's where we are. The 70th week of Daniel that is clearly articulated is called in Revelation 4 through 19, this seven-year period of tribulation as God saves Israel, returns his redemptive attention to them specifically. The church is already up here in heaven, as we've said. God's attention now returns to Israel. You can see that here on this blue line. His attention comes back to Israel. It had been on Israel back here. The church period interrupts that attention. He brings the Gentiles in. That's what scripture plainly states. But now in this 70th week of Daniel, which is what he explained to Daniel, his attention comes back to the people of Israel and his judgment is poured out upon the earth even as he brings the people of Israel to a place of salvation specifically. So, as you may have heard, this tribulation period of seven years comes to a conclusion when Israel, in chapter 19 of Revelation, finally turns to the Lord, repents, acknowledges the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the account of what they will say on that day is recorded for us in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is not only a prophecy of what would happen to Jesus, it is also a prophecy of what national Israel will say on the day when they realize he was the one and they turn to repent. That will happen at the end of the tribulation period. And it's at that point of national repentance as Israel and all who are left are backed up against the wall by the other nations of the earth that Jesus is going to return to save Israel. And the result then is the battle of Armageddon. You can see that here where Jesus returns now, this is the second coming, he returns to bring salvation to his people here at the end of this tribulation period. And it's that period of return to focus on the people of Israel specifically, judging the earth, which results then in the repentance of Israel, their national salvation as Christ returns to slay all of those who are opposing him and his people, that occupies Revelation 4 through 19. That is not just the tribulation period, it is also Daniel's 70th week, which was clearly prophesied. That now puts into perspective what's happening. So when you open your Bible and you look at Revelation 4 through 19, everything you're reading is all in the future, and it will all happen, I believe, after the church has been removed, and God returns his redemptive attention to the national ethnic people of Israel. Revelation 19 records the awful day when Jesus returns and slays everyone who is standing in opposition to him, his plan, and his people. You can see it there at the end of Revelation 19. For the sake of time, we won't read that, but you can read it for yourself. So during that time, where is the church and what's going on? Well, it's my understanding and belief that the church is celebrating their union with Christ, their bridegroom, in heaven during all of this time. And that's what's referred to in Revelation 19. It's known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there's the Bema Seat judgment. We receive our rewards. And then there's a seven-year celebration with Christ, a giant holiday feast, as we, the bride of Christ, are united fully with him, all of us being together for the very first time. And we are then united with Christ for the rest of eternity, celebrating with him in heaven, even as the tribulation period is unfolding here on the earth. In Revelation 19, 6 through 9, talks about that celebration that's taking place in heaven prior to the return of Christ. And it talks about the bride of Christ, which the New Testament makes very clear is the church specifically. The church is in heaven with Christ celebrating this marriage supper before Jesus returns to save his people, Israel. Do you see that? So it's, the, we go, 
You can see it here. Bema seat judgment. We receive our rewards for how we have lived. Then we are celebrating with Jesus during the marriage supper of the Lamb, recounted for us in the first part of Revelation 19. Before now, we return with him at the second coming as he intervenes pretty spectacularly with all the nonsense that's happening on earth and finishes his judgment upon the earth and thus closes out this seven-year period of tribulation, which is also called the 70th week of Daniel. See, that's what I mean when I say that we are pre-millennialists. We believe that Christ's coming there at the end of Revelation 19 then is going to initiate the period of rule where Christ sits on a physical throne on the earth for 1,000 years. You say, well, where do you get that from? Well, it's a pretty important text. See, it's the second coming of Jesus that now institutes this thousand-year reign of Christ, which we know as the millennial kingdom. This messianic kingdom that all the prophets had looked forward to begins after the tribulation period comes to a crashing conclusion with the battle of Armageddon. And that then initiates the thousand-year reign and rule of Christ, an event which is clearly prophesied in Revelation 21 through 6. And you can't spiritualize this and make it mean something that it doesn't. No, very clearly, we're told that it is 1,000 years where Satan is bound. It repeats it multiple times. Satan is bound for a 1,000 years that he might not do his worst and... That, that binding takes place over the course of a thousand years. He will be released for a little while. I'll talk about that in a second. And you see there that they all come to life, reign with Christ. All those who were killed during the tribulation come back to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's now the third time that a thousand years is talked about. The rest of the dead, those who are unbelieving, do not come to life until the thousand years are ended. That's now the fourth time. So, and then again, they will reign with him for a thousand years. Five times. It refers to a literal thousand year reign of Jesus. This is the reason why I cannot be an amillennialist. And neither, by the way, do I believe should you be. Because the text literally refers to a thousand year physical active reign of Christ that cannot be taken in just a spiritual sense. There is clearly a physical presence in a literal period of time that is taking place here, and you see that there in the text. And that's the reason why we say we're premillennialists. Christ returns, which then initiates the thousand-year millennial reign. And the prophets talk extensively about what this is going to be like. Satan and evil will be removed. Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. The lions will lay down with the lambs. The children will play with serpents and not be bitten. It's really a thousand years where things essentially return to the way that they were in Eden. And the prophets, Isaiah especially, are filled with information about what this time is going to be like. So it's here now that the time of the Gentiles comes to an end, and the millennial kingdom begins now at the second coming, and that's really the answer that Daniel was after. We go all the way back there. How long, O oh Lord, until the promises of your kingdom are fulfilled? The answer? Well, at least 2,600 years and counting, because that's how long the time of the Gentiles has lasted to date. But all of God's promises... Every single one, everything he ever promised to do for Israel, it will be done literally for them during the millennial kingdom. You say, now, wait a minute. There's a lot of talk about what's happening for Israel here. What's happening for me? I'm part of the church. I'm not, a, I'm not part of ethnic Israel. What, what's going on with the church during this period of time? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 through 3 talks a little bit about that. It talks about where the church is going to be in this day. We will be there in that kingdom alongside of the people of God, Israel, and we're going to have our own responsibilities of oversight that are delegated to us by Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 says, don't you know that you saints in this church age are going to end up judging the world? And in the context, he's talking to believers who were taking their divisions and their disputes into the secular law courts of the day. 
And he's saying, what are you doing taking your disputes amongst one another into a secular law court? Don't you know that if the world in the end, the millennial kingdom, he's saying, is going to be judged by you, are you incompetent? If, you're, if Christ says you're competent to judge those things in his kingdom, are you incompetent to try trivial cases and disputes and lawsuits here on earth? Don't you know that you're going to judge angels and be set up as an, an authority over spiritual things? How much more then are you qualified to judge amongst yourselves concerning matters that pertain to this life? See, he's alluding there to the position that we, as the saints of Jesus Christ, the positions of authority that we will have as we sit there with him and judge on his behalf. Now, exactly what that means and how that looks, I don't know. But I take the text at its face value, and that is what it plainly says. But that's not the end. You say, it sounds like it's the end, but it's not. Because Revelation 20 very clearly says that at the end of this thousand years, Satan is going to be released and there will be one final war with him. Now, I don't really think it's right or fair to refer to it as a war. Because what happens there in Revelation 20 is that it's really more of a little blip or a skirmish where Satan is released from heaven momentarily, or not heaven, Satan is released from the pit where he has been bound for a thousand years momentarily, and he leads in rebellion individual human beings who have been born during the millennial kingdom. See, you and I, we've been fully glorified at this point. There is no sin in us, but there are going to be people who are born to those that survive the tribulation period. They're born during the millennial kingdom, and thus they still have their sin nature. And at the end of the millennium, <laughs> Uh, Satan is going to lead those individuals in a final rebellion against Jesus Christ and Jesus is going to speak a word and the rebellion is instantly over. So that final word is a very brief kind of a blip where Satan is released, leads a rebellion, but with a word Christ defeats the rebellion and it's at that point now, at the end of human history, truly the end, that Jesus is now going to set up judgment for all unbelieving people throughout all the ages. And this is what's called the resurrection of unbelievers to the great white throne judgment. Every person who has rejected Christ. See, believers are the ones who were resurrected at the rapture, the church believers. The Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints are resurrected at the end of the tribulation period. What about the unbelievers? Jesus says very clearly in John chapter 5, verse 28, I believe, that everybody both those who have believed and those who have refused to believe will be resurrected to a day of judgment. We've already seen that day of judgment and the resurrection for the believers. It's a wonderful thing. But what about the resurrection of the unbelievers? When are they going to stand before God to receive their eternal judgment? Well, this is the point at which that happens. After the millennial kingdom, after Satan has been put down once and for all, Unbelievers are resurrected to the great white throne judgment and unbelievers from every age are now pulled before the throne of God and judged for eternity, this great white throne. And it's there, according to Revelation 21, that they are cast forever into the lake of fire. Now, let me be very clear. This great white throne judgment has nothing to do with believers from the church age or from Israel. It's a judgment of death only for unbelievers as they are condemned to eternal torment in the permanent lake of fire. That's the point at which this takes place. John chapter 5 verse 28 refers to that judgment that there will be a resurrection to life for those who have believed. We will have already received that. And there's a resurrection to death and judgment for those who have refused to believe. But you can see all that taking place there in Revelation 20. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great, the small standing before the throne. The books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books. If your name's not in the book of life, then you are judged according to what you've done. Your deeds are evil. The sea gives up the dead who are in it. Death and Hades give up the dead that are in them. And they're all judged, each one of them, according to what they've done. Then death and Hades were thrown 
into the lake of fire. Everyone who has been dead and has been suffering in hell since the time of their death are now thrown into the permanent lake of fire along with Satan and his angels. Revelation 20 says this is now the second death which is worse than the first death because it is the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Which now that sin has been defeated, the rebellion of mankind that stretches from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation chapter 20, it has been concluded. Jesus is king. He is on his immovable throne And now sin, Satan, evil have been finally defeated once and for all. Which now brings us to what is known as the eternal state. This is where we live with Christ in the presence of his Father before the Spirit of God in heaven with him forever. But it's not just any heaven. We're told that it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. In Revelation 21, 22, it's called the New Jerusalem. And it's at this point now where you can see here that Israel and the church are brought together as being one flock, resident with their God and Father forever. Jew, Gentile, No more evil, everyone glorified, everyone whom God has chosen for salvation, secured with him for the rest of eternity, living in a new heaven and a new earth, which is what 2 Peter 3, 7 through 10 tells us. The the same word that created the earth that now exists, this world, because of its sin, has been stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But he goes on, To say the day of the Lord is going to come, that day of the Lord is this whole period of Christ's return and judgment on the earth, the tribulation, the millennial kingdom, all that he will do there in that day will come like a thief. You don't know when it's coming, but it will come. We believe it will be kicked off by the removal, the rapture of the church. And then once that time period has ended, the day of the Lord is over. Then the heavens are going to pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The earth and the universe will be melted down to the level of the elements and God will recreate everything. A new heaven, a new earth, which is what he prophesies he will do there in Revelation chapter 21. Where Jew and Gentile will come together to live in harmony with God forever. A condition that is described in detail for us in Revelation 21 and 22. These are the things that are about to happen, Revelation 1 says. These are the things that you need to know. And we've just marched through the book of Revelation, essentially. We've looked at the big prophetic picture of God. Now, there are hundreds of texts that we could look at, but all of them fit neatly into this big picture that I have just given to you. And if you understand this and you read those texts, you, and maybe you need a little help from time to time, will be able to understand where this text fits and what it's talking about as it relates to this big picture of these things that are to come. So to summarize here for us and show us the structure of Revelation, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next session, Let's just take Revelation itself on its own for a minute. Now you see why if you just pick up Revelation and try to read it without any of this information as background, it's very confusing. But now now that you can see this big picture here that I've just given to you of how all these things unfold, let's just track it. Revelation 1 through 3 takes place during the church age as God gives clear instructions to his churches. But then in chapter 4, he says, now here's what's about to happen after this. Write it down, John. And he goes into essentially 15 chapters explaining what will be taking place both in heaven for the church and on earth as he judges sinful mankind and returns his attention to Israel. Revelation 4 through 19 takes place here during this tribulation period. Revelation 19, battle of Armageddon happens. Second coming takes place. Revelation 20 describes for us the millennial reign and rule of Christ. 
Revelation 21 talks about the final judgment that will come upon all unbelieving mankind at that point. Revelation 21 and 22 then talks about the new heaven, the new earth, the eternal state that we will all enjoy with him. You see, when you understand that, this book is just unfolding in chronological order. And you can take it literally in its chronological order. Everything is in its place. Everything makes sense. So where is the church? How does the church function? Well, at the cross, uh, the, the payment is made for sin. The church is instituted at Pentecost. The church survives over at least the next 2,000 years. Hopefully, we're right here at the end. That's my prayer. We are then raptured into heaven. Christ comes for us. We're raptured into heaven. We receive our judgment. We celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb at the conclusion of that time. We return with Christ at a second coming to witness his destruction upon sinful mankind. We reign and rule with him, judging on thrones with him throughout his thousand year rule. Before we enter in then to the new Jerusalem, the eternal state that is described at the end of Revelation. That's what happens to the church. What happens to Israel? Well, Israel is forced out of its land in 605 BC, and it suffers under the time of the Gentiles for the next 600 years through these successive empires that God clearly outlines for Daniel in that book. At the cross, right on time, Jesus is cut off just as God said he would be. The people of God, Israel, reject him, and so God turns his attention, as we've said, away to the church. But that doesn't mean he's done because there was the 70th set of seven where he returns his attention to Israel in the end times. He picks up his plan with Israel. He carries and preserves a number of them through the tribulation period. And they too then are present enjoying the millennial kingdom at the end of which all of us together, Jew and Gentile, are one flock living under the tutelage, the glory, the worship of our God, Father, our shepherd and savior, Jesus Christ. That's the big picture of how the last days, the last things unfold. And now that we've seen the big picture and how that revelation specifically fits into that big picture, in this next lesson, we'll take a clear look at how that tribulation period, the bulk of the book of Revelation, chapters 4 all the way through 19, unfold. I trust that this is helpful.